So, you know, I, I laid out some principles when we started the show that I wasn't going to talk about people that much, specific people. Except in this space, there have been a couple people that have, have acted really, really dishonestly. And I read just a couple days ago a piece that you wrote about some of the stuff that Reza Aslan has said. And I find him to be a profoundly dishonest player in this space. And I see what he's done to Sam Harris. Most of my audience knows about all of that already. Uh, can you explain a, a little bit about what your, what your stuff is with him? Uh, well, so this was um, in response to, I wrote, I co-wrote a piece with Mohammed Zayed, who also works with ex-Muslims in North America. Uh, there was, there's a CNN clip that's been going around, and it's making rounds again. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the CNN clip where Reza Aslan is on, and he talks about FGM, and he talks about Bill Maher, and uh, talks about how uh, FGM isn't, an, uh, isn't a Muslim problem. Uh, it's an African problem. Yeah. That's Female genital mutilation. We should just say it for the few people that may not be aware. Right. And, yeah. And, and, he, and then he, um, he puts a few other things out there uh, as evidence that uh, Muslim-majority countries are actually not that bad for women, uh, including, you know, there are some women that are heads of state, and et cetera. Um, so I wrote a piece about it, uh, co-wrote a piece about it, and published it on The Friendly Atheist. And it got this big response, because I feel like there were some people that, a good amount of people, that were wanting somebody to pick up on these things that they felt like weren't true. Mm -hmm. but they, they couldn't say this. And we said it. And we laid it out there, and we laid it out very clearly about why the points that he was making were dishonest, uh, at, the, you know, at the least. And I think in a lot of ways, he's aware of what he's doing. So he said, he said many times that... Um, you know, Muhammad, he's something to the extent of, you know, how Muhammad uh, freed the slaves. Uh, he said things in, in that vein quite a few times. And that is extremely dishonest. That is not true. It's just not true. Um, all Muhammad did was say that you can't enslave another Muslim. And there are many people, many scholars who think that this actually encouraged the spread of the slave trade because suddenly you're in Arabia and you can't slave, enslave another Muslim. So you have to go out and you mm -hmm. have to Africa and you have to go to various places to get your slaves. Uh, he did not. He didn't condemn slavery. He had slaves. He had sex slaves, um, and so there. And supposedly Reza Aslan is a scholar. I don't even know about that whole thing. I can't. I can't waste any more brain cells on that guy. Basically. Right. It's just so. It's it's very frustrating. And talking about Reza Aslan, I'm getting tired of it myself. Just to see that. Oh, he just he just makes stuff up sometimes. But, but do you think that's part of? The, but the reason I wanted to mention it because I knew you were going to be exhausted by talking about it because it's like you write your piece and then you want to move on. And that's how I felt a lot of, uh, with a lot of my interviews. I interviewed Sam and I wanted to move on to some other stuff. But then these guys just further the attack. But do you think that that's part of it? That they throw out what I would call just basic bullshit, or they throw out these lies and these smears, and then you have to spend a tremendous amount of your time and your energy and your life force basically either defending yourself or, or the honest uh, critiques that you're making. Absolutely, and I think this is the experience of, of almost everyone who has critiqued Islam in any way, and which is why we're seeing that there's just a lack of it. There's just a lack of it everywhere. I mean, there's a lack of scholarship. If you try to, to really study this, and I have, um, there, there isn't that much out there that is truly secular, that is looking at it from a very um, outsider's perspective. Um, there were some efforts to do so, but they've now been painted as Orientalist yeah. and therefore bad and therefore right wing. <laughs> of course. And so, and so there's that study sort of stopped around the time that those smears began um, and those associations with this is bigotry, if you're going to conflate this with any kind of negative, any kind of negative anything. Um, so it's, I think it's, it's really unfortunate because the scholarly um, pursuit of looking into, you know, what Islam is, how did it begin, what Muhammad did, all of that, I mean, that has just, it's suffered. It's suffered tremendously because of people's fears of being seen as a bigot, a racist, whatever. So a lot of, I think a lot of people haven't, haven't really reached out, haven't really said the things that they want to say, revealed the knowledge that they had, or even looked into it further if they wanted to, because that they're, they're thinking, well, this is going to destroy my career. What's the point? Yeah. And doesn't some of that, that fear of speaking out about this stuff, doesn't that actually show what real bigotry is? If, if you're afraid to speak out about something because you think it's going to lead to dishonest smearing of you, or really what it's about is violence to you, that's what people clearly are really afraid. I mean, I get emails now every day, literally, from all over the world that people are afraid 
to speak out. So the real bigotry is saying, we're not gonna talk about these people because guess what, they can't control their violent tendencies or something like that, right? Right, and well, it's interesting because a lot of people said this about, about the Charlie Hebdo, the cartoonists. They said, well, they should have seen it coming. That, John <laughs> Kerry, John Kerry, our Secretary of State, just in the last day or so, said basically, you know, there was some sort of rationalization. It's unbelievable. It, it's absolutely unbelievable. And to say that you, that you have it coming when you are exercising a right, exercising a right that is given to you in the country that you live in, what's the point of having a right if I can't test it to its extremes? That's the point. And in, in, in a lot of ways, what Charlie Hebdo did, for example, was not that extreme. Um, it was exactly the same treatment that they were giving Christianity. And they were p giving that exact same treatment to, to Islam. So uh, to me, it seemed like they were they were making it fair. They were saying that, hey, we're not biased and we're gonna apply the same the same uh, scrutiny to all religious forms. And they did that and I thought they were very fair about it. And then they got smeared in so many ways. Yeah, and not only did they do it out of equality where they made fun of Orthodox Jews and made fun of Christianity. I think, I, I'm gonna slightly butcher this, but I think it was something like 80% were about Christianity when they did covers related to religion and only something like 10% uh, were about Islam. Uh, but I'm, I don't quote me fully on that. But also what people fail to realize with Charlie Hebdo is that it was satire about the things that are wrong with religion. They weren't mocking Muslims as people, just as they weren't mocking Christians as people, but they were mocking archaic, age-old ideas, right? Right, absolutely. And, and in many ways, I think it can be seen as an anti-racist publication. Yeah. And, and, and I, a lot of people made a lot of good cases for this. And it's difficult because we're English-speaking people and we don't really understand the context of how, how, they, how you know, these publishers do what they do in France. But I think when you look at it um, from, in, in, from a very unbiased perspective, you'll find that there are anti-racist in a lot of ways. And it was horrible to hear people say, well, they had it coming, because it, it made it seem not only that um, they were stupid for the, doing what they were doing instead of brave, which is what they were, yeah. but but also that Muslims are beasts and animals, and we cannot expect them to behave in the same way we would expect everyone else to behave. Right, we and that's what I mean about this sort of soft, I think this is what Bill Maher refers to as the soft bigotry of low expectations. If you say anything about these people that's gonna upset them, well, then you have to just expect that they're gonna kill you, and that, that's crazy. And also, you would live in a constant hostage crisis with a certain set of the population. Absolutely, and that's, that, I mean, that's exactly the feeling of, I think, a lot of those people who tell you that, you know, I'm afraid to speak out. It, it, it is absolutely taking away from the humanity of Muslims, too, because it's turning them into beasts that we cannot, we cannot say, hey, this is a standard that we expect from everybody. We expect you to be able to handle this, and that they listen to it. Yeah. And I think that we actually haven't pushed it. We actually haven't said that, hey, this is totally acceptable. And this is totally what, how we run things in the Western world. And this is what we expect out of everyone who is here in the Western world. We expect you to respect this, especially not respond in a violent way. Right. And I haven't had that conversation. So is part of it simply that for the people that are the real Islamic extremists, they simply, at the end of the day, no matter how much my friends on the left want to blame everything on American foreign policy and all of this stuff, no matter, you know, Boko Haram killed about 160 people last week. It had nothing to do with American foreign policy, right? Um, yet this is, they always blame everything on America. And I don't deny, as I said at the top of the show, I don't deny that foreign policy has mucked up a, a lot of things. But this is where people on the left just completely fail, right? Absolutely, and I'm I'm very I'm sick of hearing that colonialism is to blame for all of this. I'm sick of it. that one particular thing I hear all the time that this is it's because of colonialism, and it doesn't really make any sense when you look into it. And again, not to say not to say that colonialism wasn't a horrible horrible practice. I mean, I'm from the South Asian subcontinent, so right. we were colonized by England, and it was horrible what England did to, to South Asia and, and the effects, the long-ranging effects it had on South Asia. But there are, it's just so easy to throw away the colonialism uh, excuse when it comes to radical Islam. I mean, I mentioned two of these in my speech, which is that uh, Muslims have been doing this sort of thing, violence, justifying violence in the name of religion, since way before colonialism ever came into the picture, right? That it's existed 
for a long, long time. And when you say colonialism is the only thing to blame, you are denying that that whole history existed, that there were so many people that were oppressed in the name of Islam. It's happened before, and it's happening again. It's the same sort of thing. Yeah, did you by any chance see a piece that Faisal Saeed al matar put up a couple days ago on Facebook where he, he writes sort of a satirical piece saying that he's he's playing this, this Muslim extremist saying, this is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for religion. And it's basically this argument with him and one of these regressive lefties saying, no, 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 it's not because of religion. And he keeps saying, no, 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 I'm doing it because of religion. And they go back and forth and go back and forth. And at the end, the guy's like, you know, what do I have to do to prove to you that this is in the name of religion? I mean, even after Paris, which I want to talk to you about in a second, the statement that these guys issued, there was a lot of religious overtones to it, a ton of religious overtones. It wasn't purely you know, this bombing in, in Syria or whatever. Well, it's, I mean, it's astounding to me that at this point, anyone can deny that religion has nothing to do with it. I truly, I, I believe that every, <laughs> that there is no one really, uh, any serious intellectual, mm -hmm. who believes that this has nothing to do with the religion. It has something, you know, and you can even make the case that it's a perverted Islam, but it is some aspect of Islamic theology that they have taken and then perverted at, mm -hmm. the, at the very least, at the very least that they have done that. And, I think that a lot of people play just lip service. They say that this has nothing to do with the religion. I don't think they believe it. I think this is, um, in, in a lot of ways, a very political move. Yeah, so I mentioned this also at the top of the show, but if, let's say, magically, the United States and the West and, and France and England and everybody, we all did whatever it is ISIS wants us to do, you know what I mean? Pull out of that part of the world, whatever else they might want us to do, do you have any reason to believe that suddenly terror would stop or that things would get better. I, I actually would see it completely the reversed. They would almost be more emboldened to continue. And I say that as someone that doesn't even want to be there in the first place. Right, I, I, I agree with you. It's, but ISIS is a different animal. And if they are, they are very strict about their interpretation. And they look into things at, in a very literal way. And if they are going to look into it as uh, in the way that, you know, Islamic uh, thought has progressed about uh, what you would call the land of the most the believers and the land of the non-believers. They are religiously, uh, th it's a duty, it's a religious duty to do what they can to spread Islam throughout the whole globe. So they're not going to stop. I mean, they've told us they're not going to stop. Why can't we just listen to them and understand that they mean what they say? Yeah, and that was the point of Faisal's uh, piece. And I got into a fight on Twitter. I try not to fight on Twitter, but I got into a fight with one of my friends on the left who kept saying foreign policy. And I kept saying, listen to what they're saying. Don't listen to me, listen, listen to what they tell you. Um, so one, one more, I just wanna jump back a little bit before we get into, into Paris. So I want people to understand there's a distinction between someone like yourself that you consider yourself an ex-Muslim, you're a non-believer, versus some of the reformers that are still either, either believers or that consider themselves Muslim, someone like Amadji Nuaz, although he said to me that you know, he doesn't wanna uh, put up his version of Islam for anyone else. But, but there is a distinction there. So there's two brands of people that we're talking about that are trying to help here, right? Uh, do you mean like progressive Muslims and... and well, meaning, meaning that there's, there's your branch that's sort of ex-Muslims, right? You fully, you are an atheist, you don't consider yourself part of the religion, versus there are some that are trying to reform the religion from the inside. Is, is there any sort of interplay with you guys? Are, are, are people working together? It's hard to tell. Well, I think that, I think it would be intellectually dishonest for us to work together in the sense that truly our aims are different. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're similar in some ways, right? We want to make sure to, we want to decrease harm in the world. We want to push uh, secularism, push human rights, uh, promote it the best that we can. But our ways of going about it are so radically different that I think that it would be, I mean, we're, I'm in contact with, with some of these people and I uh, respect them tremendously. Yeah. They're doing wonderful things. I disagree with them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there, yeah. is, there is very little about Islam and uh, the fundamentals of Islam, as, as, as Sam Harris says, that I agree with on any level. And it's hard for me to find any beauty or, or you know, compassion uh, or all these wonderful things that we would ascribe to something so holy. I don't, I don't find that in this text. So uh, there isn't really, I disagree with people when they do say that I'm a little bit extremist. You know, people say that, well, you cannot expect everyone to just apostatize all at once. But this is not what I'm pushing. I'm, I don't want the Muslim world to apostatize all at once. Yeah. But 
but it, for me, it would be intellectually dishonest to go about it on any other way. And I actually think that there is, I mean, it's atheism and secularism and, and, and free thought. I think we have a very strong critique of religion, something that is very internally coherent and ethically coherent. Um, and this case is one worth making. And if we're talking about the marketplace of ideas, it's important that we show our side and we put our best case out there. Mm -hmm. And then people will land where they'll land. So that, that's really interesting to me. So in a weird way, your, your brand here is a, little, is a little cleaner, let's say, than the people that are trying to reform it from the inside. And I don't sense that you're judging them for that as much as it really is easier to make a case from your position because you're just saying, I, I don't believe in thousand year old books, so I'm gonna make a case based on the world as it is, sort of, and they're still trying to negotiate. And that's where I see someone like Reza and where I say he, this is someone who's profoundly dishonest all the time, but I think he's trying to negotiate the world with this religion and then he uses a lot of words so nobody knows what he's talking about. But your case is a lot cleaner. Even, even if I disagreed with you, I would understand the logic more sensibly. I, I do think that in the case of somebody like Raza, I think it, it is condescending towards other Muslims because I think some people believe that, you know, Muslims will never get there. They'll never get to where you are. You're expecting too much. I don't think I'm expecting too much. Yeah. I think this is actually, if I was allowed to make this case, most Muslims do not hear anything similar to what I have to say. They will never hear anything like this. I think if they did, I think it would change things. Yeah. But they, we don't know yet, right? And we don't, we don't know that that's the case. Right, well now you did this show with me, they're gonna say you're working with a Zionist Nazi and I don't know if this is gonna help now either.